Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Isuka Kwembi, and we welcome you to this session. We are going to be uh, discussing the book, My um, Magic Battles, Library in Acquired History. When I first saw that, I thought it was such a, a unusual uh, title for a book, but as I started reading it, I said, okay, now I know what it is. So, I hope you are all going to, you all read the book before, right? How many of you read the book before? Oh, good, good, at least. <laughs> you too, right? Yeah, I'm like, uh -huh. I'm going to last that. Oh, okay. I found that. I just copied it three weeks ago. Oh, okay. I but <laughs> but that, that's, that's good. So, um, just a brief, very brief history of uh, the person who wrote the book. Uh, my Two Battle is a rare, a rare book librarian at the Harvard uh, University and the library is uh, called Widener Library. In these books, I think he, ta he takes the reader to the four corners of the world. He takes the reader to a world tour of libraries because he talks about every form of library. Even if it is a personal library, someone's uh, a personal collection, they call it libraries. So he takes the readers to different kinds of libraries from the, when they started writing books on the clay tablet, tablets to when they moved to the scrolls to today when we have the, the actual book, what we call book, and then including the wide uh, web he takes the reader to a four corners of the world, like I said before. He discussed the book collections and the culture, the importance of those collections, and he also talks intensively uh, about the entities that collect these books, like the popes, the monks, and you name it. Every part of the world, he went there and discussed about the book in those areas and the destruction of those collections. Well, I will now hand you over to uh, my colleague, Dr. Joyce Fye. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, jo I'm Joyce Dixon Fye from the from DePaul University. And I've seen quite a few, a few of you are familiar uh, with um, um, this kind of session, we always I always take a nerdy book and sort of look into it and pull it apart for us to see what kernels of wisdom we can get out of it. Um, as my colleague said, Matthew Battles um, is by profession um, a rare book librarian, and so. Uh, any encounter with his, with his work would put you in local parlance, it puts you in nerd kingdom. It puts you there. I read something he wrote initially when I was reading, when we were reading your book about reading in the digital age. And he had worked on a project, he wrote a book reading in the digital age. And I read Matthew Battles, who had written something entitled Beyond the Book, the Library Beyond the Book, and that was how I read both of you. Yeah, that's what I wanted to So um, I knew what I was getting into when I took it. But I must confess, I liked that part of it. Because I always feel that um, we should, as librarians, as professional academic librarians, remember uh, that we are academics for, uh, also and that we should never forget that and neglect that, that aspect of our professional being. Uh, so in that vein, I implore you not to look at the book as a nerdy book or something that has so much intertextuality that it requires uh, not the fate of art, as someone would say. 
but there is always a kernel of, 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 of information, a kernel of truth, which is valuable to all of us, and we always learn from it. So the first thing that he does, that I would talk about is, um, I'll talk about the structure of the book. It took me a few readings to understand the structure of the book. He laid the book out in such a way. He was talking about. He was talking about the the future of the library, the life of the library, because in every academic library at this time, you know that um, in, um, on the agenda is something about the future of the library. Either it's funding or money for something, or librarians having to make do with less, or students not reading the books that are acquired, or acquisitions budgets being cut, or something. So the, the future of the library, or in terms of reading space, in terms of reading styles, in terms of the, um, the relationship between the reading styles and study spaces, and the library becoming a, almost a warehouse, and the library almost becoming a cafe shop, and the library almost becoming um, a hub, you had to look at the library as a space, as a different kind of space, almost every year. So because of that, it is always under budget. It is always looking at itself. So reflexivity, reflexivity is not um, a far-fetched phenomenon in library, um, in library um, um, studies. So what he did was, he wanted to talk about the library today, the state of the library. But he wanted to give us a panoramic view. A panoramic view of the best um, example I can think of is a diamond. You, if you look at a diamond, it is multifaceted. You can only see its reflexivity. You can only see its complexity. You can only, you can only see its colors, its radiance when you take a look at all the facets and when you turn it. And so if you are holding this book, hold it as a multi-faceted diamond and look first at it at a panoramic view. And you will see that, in, in, and don't be intimidated by the intertextuality. Um, you, um, it's true that it's some, somebody who has read a lot. And so he's, and, and he, coming from Harvard, he has to show that he knows what he's talking about. So you have to forgive him. You have to forgive him that part. I forgive him that part. <laughs> I forgive him that part. So I, I, I appeal to you to forgive him that part. To show you that he, when he wants to talk about uh, something about this, about humanity, she talks about Cleopatra. She goes, she goes to the Cleopatra and so on. So when he wants to talk about power, he talks about Caesar. You know, he goes into the works that is written, he expatiates on his knowledge. And that is what academics do. And we don't blame them for that. But, after he given us a panoramic view, he turns the book around and puts the kernel of the book in a few chapters, which he calls the afterword. And that, those are the chapters that speak to what the library is today. So if you understand that, you will not be put off by the fact, but then you, you have to understand, you have to read the first set of the book, the first part of the book, to understand his tropes. Because his tropes are very important, and the tropes will form a key to the understanding of the final, of the final um, 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 verdict of the text. So I'll start by saying that he was inspired by the widespread admiration of the Harry Elkins White the Library of Harvard. Anyone who has been to the Harvard Library would agree that his description is apt, that his reaction is true, and that it is a literal representation of the word awestruck. You, you, you will be awestruck by Harvard. And, and you have to forgive them for the fact that when you go there, they almost take your fingerprint. They, they don't allow you to go into it. Don't take your fingerprint, take your... I had never been fingerprinted before until I got there. <clears throat> I was fingerprinted. You take your ID and everything. But you have to understand the pride they have in their collection. It is, an, it is the epitome of careful selection. It is the epitome of erudition, which informs that selection. And for as a collection development librarian, uh, I was staggered by the intensity 
of that collection and the scope of the collection and not to talk about the wisdom of it. So inspired by him, started off by telling us, by putting us in a frame of mind in which he, we feel that he's inspired by the undisputed admiration for the Harry Elkins Library, at which he refers to as the great unsinkable library. So that word, that unsinkable, is a trope which follows, which runs through the book. Because the library of today, in his eyes, the libraries of today are sinking. And if you look at the tropes in the book, he always uses those tropes to show that the library, in some regard, is always on a downward um, 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 spiral. And that it is not um, an unsinkable, the unsinkable, it has a, 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 a connotation which to me tells me that something is pulling it down. And that it is not a, it is not a, it is not a, 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 a an involuntary, it is not a voluntary act, it is an involuntary response to some kind of force which he is going to sort of characterize. So when he describes it as, a, as, a, as an unsinkable library, he is celebrating man's quest for knowledge and also the pleasure of reading and also the physicality of the book. In reading the text, you almost have a sensual feeling that is looking at the book as a body, the library as a human body. And he talks about it uh, in, in, in a way which only a bibliophile can appreciate. And we can only describe it as mesmerized by the sheer vastness of the library. He wrote, but the library, <coughs> especially one so vast, is no mere, it's no mere cabinet of curiosities. It is a world. It is a world complete and incompletable. And it is filled with secrets. Like a world, it has changes and its seasons, which belie the permanence that order ranks of books imply. So it is not only a world, but it is a world that is sensual, that is tactile, a world that is living. It is like a living organism. So you have, you, you have from this point to understand the reason why he approaches the work with so much reverence and respect. In his estimation, the ideal library is multifaceted. It is, it is tactile, it is mobile, it is sensual, and at, and at one point he admits it. He said it's like a body. The pages of books pressed together like organs in the darkness. And so his love for the library is undisputed. He makes it clear in a picture which I wanted to, 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 to bring to your attention. And he sort of looked at it like said he, as a librarian, in the library is for him like a body. And he was able to locate and, and, and um, 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 textualize that feeling in a painting that was written by, by paint, done by somebody called Alcim, Alcim Bold, I can, Alcim Boldo. And if you look at that work, if you look at that painting, and listen to the description, In the wildness talks more than anywhere else, I can fool myself that the universe is composed of infinite variations of a single element, the book. That I too am made of books, like the person in Giuseppe's Alcibundo's painting, the librarian. Okay, so there is a meta, a meta, a metonymic, what's the metaphor? It's a metonymic, that means that for he becomes when something becomes a metonym, it means that that you meld into it and it becomes the thing. For example, if you say um, um, the, the news is suffused by information from the bench, you are talking about the law, the law system, the legal system. So that's a metonymic transfer. You take a, a quality of one of the elements and make it uh, uh, um, into a fact. So he's taking the quality of this painting 
he's making it into a fact that this librarian, this person, is a, it's not only the image of the librarian, but it is a, he himself. He said that I too am made of books like the person in this, in this painting and embodied in the librarian as Simbondo leveled in the painting of the librarian. It's a person made of books. He is not a single book, but a whole library. His cheeks and lips are miniature books. The sort that that that, that, that in, the, in the in the painting, time would have contained prayers and devotion. His right arm, by contrast, is a weighty volume. Pages fan out from his head, marked not with type but with handwriting, legible only for the world. When I when I read that passage in the book. I started taking it seriously. <laughs> so I realized that when you're dealing with someone, it's like you're dealing with a child coming home from school and it's like, oh, there was a humongous elephant. The elephant had big feet. You, you, you saw that he literally believed it. He saw that he took part in it. It he was almost him. So at this point in the book, the author transposes himself and his voice changes and the first thing he does he tells you what helps him he looks at the fact that the library the library you know it is more it is more poignant in literature okay? I mean, you can tell I'm a literature person you, it's more poignant in literature to talk about something else when you want to talk about something so what does he talk about he talks about burning in Alexandria. He talked about the, uh, the indifference that characterizes uh, people, the, uh, the people's attitude towards the art, mu the arts, music, poetry, learning, and the example of the grammarian, for example, the Coptic priest, that who said that over the years, over the course of history, early libraries in the form of collections and schools had become victims had become victims of censorship. That was the first thing that bothered him. He said that these libraries, they were um, like intellectual communities, which had become um, victims. Um, and, and, and it was an assault on the heritage, he said, and that the rich acclaim of libraries um, had, been, um, had been assaulted. And that was mandated uh, by the autocrats who mandated the burning of many early libraries. So you see how he, he, he makes the leap. He makes a connection. He says it's the body, and then by the same time that somebody you think that he was going to be sensual, and then he leaps into something that assaults that body. And that assault characterizes his narrative. So the autocratic rulers who were irate or insecure over the growing presence of the intellectual community and the rich heritage of learning, etc., and the, the growing importance of library holdings, precious texts, papyrus scrolls, and all that, they mandated the destruction of books at which were used to build the heritage, the cultural heritage of the city. talked about censorship. Censorship is an abiding topic in libraries, in, li in the life of libraries. Um, in different communities, they're called different things. Sometimes you hear it now it's called banned books. But if you look at it very closely, it is, it is censorship. So early libraries suffered the vagaries of censorship. It was an act that came in many guises in spite of the threat of war to enlightened emperors like um, Ashu Banipal, what's he doing? He dropped all these names, all these historical names. Yes. That included collections, omens, incantations, and means, etc., etc. But most of those um, um, collections were assaulted by the hubris of those rulers. Then he left that, and then he talked about something else. He said something about the maps. 
of early Mesopotamia. He went to Mesopotamia and showed us that we all know that Mesopotamia was the cradle of, 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 of intellectual activity. But he said that even in spite of all their attributes, in spite of all their intellectual features and their intellectual promise, that those libraries were also subjected to the whims and practices of leaders. And then he said, the Greek, and then he went ahead and called the name. The Greek geographer Strabo, however, who seems to have known the library, tells us that Aristotle's books had been buried in a hole in Athens to keep them from being claimed by Attalid kings, the rulers of Athens, who wanted them for life or something else. So, hoarding of books, hiding of the intellect, suppression of the individual talent. Um, um, 20 years ago in the 20th century, he wrote at the individual talent that was late in the game. He's telling us what happened to early individual talent in the libraries and that they had been under assault by the time. He also went ahead and gave examples about emergency disasters. Emergency disasters are a reality in library life. Is it fire? Is it flooding? Is it mold? Is it water damage? Is it, is it um, um, students torching a collection just because they don't want to take a test? So what he said to you, what he said to us here, he said libraries ran the risk of emergency disasters, including the vagaries of the weather. He said Aristotle, Aristotle's collections of books suffered, suffered water damage. They were worm eaten and they were damaged. They were dug up and sold to book collectors, um, like one of them was called Apelico who while collating and amending them inclu in, 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 in included many inaccuracies. So the question of authority, authorial, I mean authority, authorial agency has been assaulted even from that time. So when you will get to the end, when he's talking about the assessment of the current day, you will see that these are the tropes that he uses for the, for, in his last chapters. Then he said, the early libraries had book stacks. He looked at several of the of the several several of the of the um, the ancient writers, and he liked Aristotle because Aristotle was one of the earliest um, 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 agents who introduced the library in, in the sense that he brought in people uh, uh, and he, the students would walk around with him with their collections of books. That's what over the earliest. And he would look for a shaded area conducive to study and discussion. And so Plato, who was a student, did the same. He looked for what is known in, in, in Plato's Republic as the early, the shaded roof, which foreshadowed the reading room with tables and chairs and emphasis on the uh, on the conduciveness of the condition um, 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 of the library um, environment. So those tropes should not be uh, they're not they're not inadvertent. They're not inadvertent. <coughs> so and then he says, well, because um, papyrus was the the reed that was used to write on at the time. The scrolls that were made out of them, the early materials, they were not easy to access. So talk about mobility, moving them. So, and also, we always talk right now about uh, this, and we talk about this a lot when we're talking about the new digital uh, materials, disks and all that. We talk about the strength of materials, that the disk is fragile. Well, the papyrus was fragile. It was biodegradable. It was subject to rot. It was sensitive to it was sensitive to moisture, and it rotted. And it and worse, it was almost difficult to access. Why? Because they stuck together. So he raised the question of the condition of materials um, in his work, and the condition of materials um, that we talk about when we're looking at reading and all those kinds of things. Now. He 
said that, and this is very subtle. He said that the, in the Alexandrian Library, the Alexandrian Library, Library of Alexandria, when people, the intellectual community started growing, um, growing, they were referred to derisively as bookworms. As bookworms. Now, we refer to some of these people as nerds. Right? We, we have, that is, that, that tendency to name call, to label, to label people, to, they, they, they call them bookworms. But he said that that notwithstanding, those early people, those people in the Alexandrian Library, were advocates um, for what we now call academic seriousness. The concept of academic seriousness is a serious phenomenon in the academy. If you send your child to a university and that university is known um, as one that doesn't have academic seriousness, you better put your child there. So he said that the early Alexandrian library worked on the concept of academic seriousness by bringing scholars and inviting them to live and work at royal expense among the enormous stores of books. The Ptolemies made the library into a think tank under the control of the royal house. So the concept, like the conference, where you go in and your, your university feels that it's a, it is a part of your professional development, they were, it was a very crude early form. But we have to read this text with a critical eye. The Alexandrian collection had to buy for supremacy with the libraries at Rhodes and Pergamon, both of whose threats to Alexandria's preeminent were stemmed and when the academic community was becoming very powerful, what did they do? They banned the importation of papyrus. So censorship runs through the ranks. But he said that even in spite of all these assaults, and now I'm jumping, I'm skipping, in spite of all these assaults, like books, like translations like Euclid, translations like Archimedes, translations like Erastonis, they may, may not have survived had it not been for the work of scribes and had it not been for the work of early translators. So Bartos applauds the quest for academic freedom. He pioneered it, which was pioneered by the early libraries, and he noted that the challenges remain the same today. The challenges remain the same today. Adequacy of reading space, house of school, have, 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 for example, in the housing of schools, and the fragility of the material. He compared them to more desirable clay, which became later um, a different form of. But then, given such free reign, the academic freedom grew because these academic communities learned to achieve what they had. And the library slowly assumed and came into its own concept of the think tank. That was the, the first chapter, and I paid attention so much closer to reading to the first chapter to call attention to the troops, and you can pick up that from there. But then he talked about the library mission, which was the second one. The mission of the library is academic, in his own, and the, the propagation of learning. And he said, in, during the first centuries, there are so many cultural studies among the Jews, the Christians, etc. He said among the strongest accomplishments and what was that mission, that desire to compete, to complete the entire corpus of Greek literature. You know, Greek literature had, had its own its own size and etc. And so what did they do? They introduced the study of foreign languages. And not only for the, the problem of intertextuality, but today we call it global, globalization. So the concept of globalization, the concept of inclusion of other was present in the early libraries. And thus was Alexandria the first library with universal aspirations, with its community of scholars. It became the prototype of the University of Alexandria. 
It was done by adopting a system of acquiring authoritative manuscripts of ancient writers like Homer who were read in translation and the centralized and, co um, and consolidated libraries and protected them from war, disaster, decay, everything that we call emergency things like that. This spirit runs through the text and I did that, I went through that in this way for you to see that um, you, you, in reading the text, you have to be sensitive to the tropes. But then, a century after, now I'm skipping big time, a century after, uh, after that, remember when he was writing this book, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have um, um, digital, digital um, uh, technological advancement. He wrote it in 2003, and, and the technologies have changed so much. And so that is what he did. He now went to the afterward. Because that text, that body of the text that we just talked about, he wrote in 2003, 2005, 2003. And then he came 2015 and put that afterward. And it is in the afterward that he now expatiated on tropes. Censorship, library space, acquisitions budget. Um, yesterday there was a presentation and it was on a presentation in scale. I, 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 pre I pre prefer not to ask a question for several reasons. But there was one library that had a, to, to deal with um, streaming, that had to deal with streaming, and the, the university gave them $2,000. And there was another library that had to deal with streaming, and they had $92,000, and they had to out. <laughs> so I kept stepping on my toe and saying, this is none of your business. Ask no questions because I wasn't going to sort of upset the apple cart. What are you going to do with two thousand dollars when you have somebody with ninety-two thousand dollars at any? So, so the inequality. So that inequality that you have to read the top of inequality in the libraries. Those libraries, these early libraries that were um, uh, assorted in many, many ways. They also operated on the level of inequality. Imagine the influence of the uh, of the Merovingians, of Ptolemy, and all that when they inserted themselves in the history of the libraries. You will see that in the middle of the text, that is what you will pick out. You will see how those libraries that survived, how those libraries that survived, how those libraries that had money did better than those that didn't. But a century after that, in a bid to protect his kingdom, Alexander encircled his city with a wall, right? A wall. Now, I'm not going into the top of a wall. I am not going to the top of a wall. I am skirting the top of a wall. I am going to literature to, to hide behind. I'm telling you about the wall, the, the wall of China, the Great Wall of China. It was meant to keep away other. But when it, they built the wall to keep, to keep away other. What else did they keep out? They kept out everything. So, at that point, he juxtaposed the concept of megalomania, megalomania, and the brutality of the assault on intellectual life. That is at the juncture. And then he moved away from that and he went to the to the modern I have to skip and go to the modern he said that when you look at when he looked at, the, at life he remembered an experience uh, about something called Geniza and it is a word that he took out of Hebrew he had to show that he understands Hebrew he has to show us that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he has to show us that. He said Hebrew was the word, and he told us the, the, the etymology and all that. I understood that. He said it was the word for a container. But the important thing for us is that sometimes, as librarians, we have a glib, we tend to be glib about reading. We tend to be glib and reckless about reading. And so he said the Hebrew word for container 
when, uh, when used in the rabbinic tradition, they decided that rather than people assaulting their holy books, what would they, they would create a space called a geniza. And that geniza is where they would throw away all those books which were no longer useful, which were no longer which were too old, but he said that they respected the intellectual tradition, they respected the tradition too much, they respected their religion too much to allow them to assault their books. But he said that we picked up the throwaway culture and picking up the then we forget to preserve the old, which was the initial which was the initial intent. And what we practice is like a kind of abuse and a kind of profanation. And so he went into textual history. He has the man is a show boat. He has to show that he knows. So you have to so he went in and then he took the holy book and he said he said, and now I'm looking at Judaica. I found, found, he put some articles in it and put some few words. I said, yes, Mr. Battles, you know, come to the point. And so he said, he said, the splendor of decay, the splendor of the decay of, of, of printed materials, he said it held invaluable information, even though they were fragments. And what do we know about that? He said, um, the biblical text, all the things that they call the philacteria that turn out to be an invaluable source to tertiary historians and scholars, he said they kept in the Eliza. And that when somebody went and discovered it and found the printed text and took some of them and decided to take some and leave some, up till today, it constitutes the singular most important regret in the, in the academy that they didn't pick up those manuscripts. So, right in the middle of the book, he says, even the modern, he said, books emerge as sacred in the estimation of the writer. They represent various things, they reflect different circumstances, they reflect freedom, history, they, it, uh, it's like a tool, it becomes like a door, it becomes a key, all of these are tropes which you will see in the book. And it, 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 it says it's a passport. And then, and it says it's a, it's a, trans, it's a transport, means of transport. And then finally, he said it's an anchor. And it's like, and remember that he used the, the word for the ship that was sinking. It says it's an anchor. And then he said, finally, well, it's a boulder. <laughs> so, so he said, but in any library, even within its myriad of changes and books, and then he talked about, he went, did the same thing with the library classification systems. He talked about the order of the classifications in the early writings. And he said, even in the digital age, it's like a labyrinth, what's going on right now. That you, when it is not bandwidth, it's something else. When it is not, and he wrote a book. He wrote a book, and he took it one step further. And he talked about the assault of the internet, of the digital, on the digital age and media, and how it has almost decimated that love and that need to read intelligently. He did that. And so he was, he, um, he assumed, he said that the library is in a state of flux, which is indistinguishable from a state of crisis. He said it's not only for the institutions, but for the books they contain, they preserve and propagate a crisis for the culture of letters, whose goods are firmly planted in the library. And so it says the comment library, uh, it's in, in, on top of the, 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 the confusion that we have in books, in, in the internet, has a lack of a problem with space, loss of funding, the real and formidable um, um, choices that they have to make, and he said the dangers that the library, current library face, he described as Faustian. Faustian, you know what happened to Faust, what happened, what happened to Faust. You don't want to be, to be described, your work or your efforts, to be described as Faustian. And for the people who are not aware, when we say something is Faustian, it's too bold. One, that, it is, it is quite um, 
Machiavellian. It's very self-centered. It's very mean. But, and it's that word that you don't want anybody to use, it's unprincipled. His character, Faust created a character called Mephistopheles. And what Mephistopheles did, he sold his soul to the devil. So, when he said that the problems that life with the libraries face today are not only a lack of space and everything, they say it says they face problems that are Faustian and there are many dangers. I thought that was the most damning statement in the book. He said we should strive to be leaders. And we should strive that whatever we do, we should strive to look at the library, to look at libraries as something to be kept. And and that is where I'm going to end. Because and I'm going to read you this section on the book in the book. Where he says something like um, he talked about he had talked about the Google books. I don't want to go into all the details with you because you know the scopes now, you can go back and look at them. He said, um, the library should be looked at as something that is dedicated to the observation that no matter how much knowledge we produce, how many stories we tell, the sum total of the mystery in the universe remains undiminished and undiminishable, and that the library is not going anywhere. That we should consider the library as, and this is, this is not strange, considering his profession. So the library should be considered like a depository, an ex, um, what they call it, off-campus, off-site depository, where you do not throw away the books, you do not destroy the books, but you keep them there, and that you have a, you have a system that is um, um, acceptable, that is um, 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 that pro um, pro uh, promotes access, a system that is not tangled, um, uh, it's not labyrinthian, that's the word he used, it's not labyrinthian, but something that organizes knowledge in such a way that you have access to it. And that no matter how ugly the container is, and he, com he compared, he used the, co the, the, the example of the off-site storage of Harvard. They have a formidable storage. So many miles of text. But he said the container that they put it in was so very ugly that the books were going to outlive the container themselves. <laughs> I mean, so you will read that book, that passage for yourself and enjoy it. But he said that notwithstanding, knowledge and the preservation of it should be paramount in our minds. And so because of that, the library's history in his estimation is at once promising but unquiet because it has brought with it that baggage of history, that baggage, that retinue of problems that he traced as early as the medieval and And so because of that, I wanted us to sort of have enough time for discussion for people who right now are talking about the future of the library to see how um, uh, some of these, pro these problems manifest themselves in the library and to see how they, um, um, how they confront them and what are the solutions and to, or to see how um, what, what, what problems do not, affect you, do not affect you. Maybe some of you may be lucky that you may have unlimited funds. You come from a library that have unlimited funds. Or some of you may be lucky that you have um, um, a library that is peopled by intellectual intellectuals that are, not, that are not that are not unprincipled, you know. So you may, or some of you may be um, um, lucky to have people users of the library who are so keen on knowledge that no matter no matter what happens to the condition, no matter what happens to the chairs, no matter what happens to whether the internet is down, they come anyway. So I wanted us to open that discussion, and I will appreciate your comments. Thank you.